following conversation between Elvis Mitchell and Paul Thomas Anderson was recorded live at LACMA's Bing Theater. It followed a double feature of two war documentaries by John Huston, 1945's San Pietro and Let There Be Light from 1946. Anderson cites both films, which he found on YouTube, as highly influential during the making of his latest film, The Master, which is currently nominated for three Academy Awards. So talk to me about the first time you saw Let There Be Light. Well, like I said, uh, it was on YouTube. And, um, um, sorry, um, I'd never seen anything quite like it. Just, um, I guess with the first film, which I think I watched at the same time, um, you know, taking nothing away from it, because it's a great film, but... You've seen explosions off in the distance and the camera rattle. I was familiar with that stuff, and it had already kind of, you know, it had already maybe become desensitized to it in a sort of terrible way. But this was something, these close-ups of these fellas and hearing them talk and, and long takes. It was, not, it was not battle footage. It was obviously the aftermath of the battles. And, um, yeah, it was just no wonder they didn't want anybody to see it. Um, and it was just a great, for at the time, was writing the master and, you know, you can get, you can only go so far when you get, a, you know, when you're trying to sort of get in the head of another time um, and you sort of get hungry for more. Films of that period don't do it, you know, but, but seeing a documentary from that period and something that's laid so bare was, um, God, I just, I watched it again and again and again and again and um, it was at a time in, when I was writing it where I was feeling pretty good about what I had, but something, I just felt like something was missing, and suddenly you, you get lucky enough to kind of discover something, and it just kind of opens up for you maybe a story that you were working on, and, this, and that's what that did, seeing that there be light did for me. Was it that sense because in that movie, unlike any John Houston movie, even unlike Under the Volcano, there's just a sense of these guys being completely lost in their own bodies? <laughs> Perfectly said, yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny, too, to see this kind of happy ending put on it, um, which you could feel, um, I don't know. I know he had a rascally sense of humor, not that he was applying it to this film, but you could feel maybe he was like he was saying, well, I just put a little swell of music and say that everything's okay, and maybe I can get away with it, you know, as if and the War Department probably said there's, there's, there's no swell of music big enough, you know, to, to, to make it okay what you've done. But, yeah, um, the fella, the, the black guy is talking about his wife, you know, that letter. Um, it just doesn't get any more, more harrowing. Or, or, so seeing somebody like that so vulnerable and so naked, you just never... He never saw, he never saw that it was sort of uh, fellas from that era that came back. You just never saw them kind of bearing their souls, and I'd never seen anything like that. So. No, it's unique. I'm sorry, I forgot to say at this point. Uh, please, no recording of this. Uh, we got lots of people with fully charged tasers who are ready to take each and every one of you out because they're really sadistic. Um, but the thing that, about the masses that kind of applies. Yeah, getting back to the conversation. What a segue. Um, the thing that really I, I feel from Let There Be Light in, in, in The Master is that your movies before The Master, death was always kind of like something, kind of a specter in the background. But this is a movie that kind of starts with a guy recovering from being surrounded by death. And that really seems to have influenced the way The Master starts to me. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, too, I mean... In, in, a, in a practical way, just for making that film, was like, you just ask yourself, you know, are you going to go shoot some war footage and stuff like that? And that's a real big investment, not only of time and effort and energy and money, but are you going to be able to do something that, you know, hasn't been shown before? Do you need to do that? But just, you know, for that film that you're talking about, just one look at Joaquin Phoenix, like when you look at these guys, just look at these faces, and you don't need anything else. Um... Um, that, that's, that's a sort of thought that just occurred to me there. But I feel like the, the Battle of San Pietro, so to me, the best part of that film, we're talking about this, uh, yes, you have all this harrowing war stuff, but getting to the end and you see these faces when you just did this kind of relief. To, and it's not a relief, but um, it's, um, it, it's faces. You know, It's not landscapes and, and explosions, as, as haunting as that is, but 
the second you see the faces, everything just comes rapidly into focus. And Let There Be Light is exclusively faces, you know, there's no war footage at all, so... And yeah, and the, in those faces is all that kind of collateral damage from the battles. Right. Those, those starved kids with those lines under their eyes and those worry lines on their, in their foreheads. And, and Let There Be Light, those guys, it's just that, just that pain in their faces. Yeah, it's pain in their faces, but also, too, um, just something that's great about the film is the, 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 how, they do, how they do talk about it, you know, because there was always this sort of, um, the, the, you know, the, it was the generation that wouldn't talk, wouldn't talk about it, and they kind of kept it all to themselves, and so, you know, I guess that's true, but here these guys were really pouring their heart out, and there's the, just the interesting thing of sort of watching these guys try to mess around with all these different methods about how they might be able to help them or cure them, sodium pentothal and hypnosis and Rorschach tests and all that kind of stuff, which, I don't know, did it, make it, only, did it only make it worse, or did it, did it help? I don't know. It, it didn't seem to help, but the funny thing was that, that there's so much confidence in each of these treatments that didn't really seem to do anything. Right. And, and watching the master, I mean... Well, I love the doctor, that, that kind of real nuts and bolts doctor, right? You know, he's just like slapping him around, right? <laughs> just like a Tex Avery character is a doctor. It's like a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And, um, he, the only thing he doesn't say is snap out of it. I mean, this only thing is missing. From yeah, that. he stops just short of saying snap out of it. Um, but um, for that film, for The Master, you know, there was, there was, there was obviously it, it helped feed into ideas that, that, that eventually got into L. Ron Hubbard's head in Dianetics, which is sort of how, to, how to work with um, um, mental illness, you know, how to kind of, how to, how to just work with the mind, you know, that was the kind of thing that he got into, and I think he did spend time in naval hospitals. Um, so he was obviously around all this kind of stuff. So whatever he was doing was not enti- this entirely made-up thing. He was kind of around this stuff and funneling it into what he was working on, um, yeah. Because when, he's, uh, when, when, when uh, Philip is, is questioning Joaquin, it's almost that same kind of thing as his doctor. He's like really trying to sort of probe this soft spot because he understands that there's trauma. There's that admission of trauma, basically, in the conversations, and it's really like watching these interrogations in this. Yeah, that's right. Um, a lot of those things had been formed, you know, in, in, in the script for The Master before I saw this, but it's that kind of lucky thing that it sort of helps verify maybe something that you've made up or you found somewhere else. It just helps you kind of feel like you're on the right path when I was seeing this stuff. And, yeah, that kind of, those kind of hard-hitting questions that kind of are, are meant to kind of break you down or get you to kind of to open up. Um, nothing entirely new. I mean, it's all kind of, you know, psychology or psychosis, but sort of, Psychology, um, bringing, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have a, a couple other questions, it's okay. Um, because in, in that sequence, especially, have a little something, that'll, well, yeah, that'll help the toddy. There you go. I like when you're a little woozy on stage, and then I own you. Now you're Joaquin Phoenix. Um, the, cutting in that, <laughs> the cutting in that section reminds me of John Hughes, Houston's cutting. I mean, what I was saying before, that what he said basically an edit came when naturally you would blink and and that kind of sort of cast iron cutting this is the cut this is the cut this is a cut really is in that sequence i mean i'd never heard that he said that before but, Absolutely, that, but yeah. that's great um and makes sense to me i think i respond to his films just how nuts and bolts they are um they're really kind of lean mean fighting machines and and um whatever it is it floats my boat about it i really like i like that about his films um l- love it actually and yeah um you know treasure sierra madre I talked a lot about it was a big influence when there will be blood and that was a kind of beginning of a real hardcore obsession with his stuff and feeling like just so muscular. Um, but in addition to not just muscular in that, you know, John Ford was muscular too, and he had a sort of sentimental side, but I think John Huston was a great writer too. That was always I respond to um, his, his writing as well. Not, not really known as a writer, but his adaptions of books and things like that. Oh, sure, because what the, he does that I always, that I find myself thinking about with, with your stuff is there are always these kinds of questions of masculinity, except in his movies, those questions were always answered, and your movies, those questions basically aren't. 
Well, he was more of a man than I'll, I'll ever be. I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. I remember you telling me about the steak and tequila diet when you were cutting There Will Be Blood. That, was that steak, sounds very that, John Huston to me. That was steak and vodka. Um, <laughs> yeah, the connections end there. I mean, he's, you know, listen. <laughs> I, do, I do live in the same neighborhood, though. He built a house uh, out where I live, and he built, it's still there, actually. Um, great house, and they ended up. Sh- he built it, and they ended up shooting uh, Red Badge of Courage, and all in the sort of backyard out, out where I live. Um, it's now populated by a lot of houses and stuff. But yeah, so did you read Picture, the Lillian Ross book? On I the, did. I did. That, isn't that great? Yes, it is. Yeah, because it's it's just one of the the rare sort of looks into. So ent- how entirely the science stuff he was. I mean, if you read that and White Hunter, Black Heart, right, you get a real sense of. That thing he always knew what he was going to do, even and no matter what the cost. Yeah, yeah, um, and and uh, probably uh, you know many times against um, what was better for him. You know, I mean he didn't, which which translates into the films better or worse. Really not some bolts attack and just like you know a kind of streamline of vision. I don't think there was a lot of kind of poetic thinking or kind of you know hemming and hawing that went on. And um, yeah, yeah. But he was also, I don't know, I don't want to sort of say it's all just nuts and bolts with him, too, because he was such a painter, and he, 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 was a, he probably was a romantic at heart, and you can feel those kinds of things coming through in his films, too. I think mean, just because you make a film that's, that's as cut and dry as Let There Be Light is, I don't, I, it, 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 you know, it would, be, it would be wrong to assume that he sort of was sort of, cold, you know, sort of a cold person. He, if anything, it's the opposite. I mean, he was, he was nuts and bolts in the filmmaking to allow what was happening in front of him to, to do the talking. You know, it wasn't filmmaking getting in the way. He was such a humanist that the, I think this idea of blinking when you cut probably is based on, well, let them tell the truth. I don't want to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to tell the truth by, or, or make my own truth by kind of cutting it up a bunch of different ways. I'm going to let what's happening um, speak for itself. Did you like that, though, that precision in the cutting in that sequence, that question and answer sequence? Because that felt so new to me for you, that kind of just let's, keep, let's, let's get on with this kind of thing. Well, I have to admit that that's probably just a function of being able to shoot with two cameras at the same time. So you can, you know, literally on a computer these days, just press when you feel it. You know, it's like less, less like the, the old days, you know, you'd sort of get two cameras and you have a big long scene, you're just, you know, to get everybody matching and get rhythms right and everything else. And that's kind of a, you know, which he did not have here. You know, I don't know how they did. Well, they must have had two cameras. I don't know. Um, but, um, oh, that's, that's just a lazy f- thing. You can press a button and <laughs> it's terrible. I didn't mean, expose your laziness to his I, no, audience here. This is yeah, awful. It's more of a feeling, you know, so it's like, when, when do you want us to look, look somewhere else, you know? But it, it, it felt like that to me, cause especially just seeing th- that stuff and, and, and just also watching, um, um, watching uh, The Maltese Falcon again. Mm-hmm. Which really has that, and and there's and there's at this incredible momentum, and there's a kind of a something I don't often think of in your films a real kind of narrative momentum in the, in that particular scene because mm-hmm. usually it's sort of like playing out in terms of character, but it feels like it's building towards something like a real climax at the end of that sequence. Right, that's just yeah yeah. I mean, was it on the page? Well, no, it's on. It was on the page. You're talking about when they're asking questions back and forth. I mean, is, there's an inherent thing though in that, and then it is a cliffhanger. You're sort of, uh, we're gonna, you know, and that's just luck of the draw to get a scene that, that can work like that can actually work as a suspense scene and 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 work as this dynamic interplay. But at the same time, you're learning something about um, this person, this character. So these kinds of ideas of screenwriting, only you know, plot and momentum and character and and you know. Usually the worst scenes that you have to go do in a movie are the ones that will, will move the story forward. You know, you've got to stop for a second and somebody has to kind of say some really horrible dialogue about, you know, well, the reactor, you know, is, will blow up if we don't have, you know, whatever it is. But, but they're necessary because you've got to keep, you know, and it's like you just scratch your head the day that you have to shoot those. Like, how can we, come, how can we get this off without seeming, like, re- completely ridiculous? But a scene like the one you're talking about it was just sort of, you know, all, was, you can get, you know, you get lucky that everything's happening at once. You're learning new information, and you're on the edge of your seat, yes. and you want to find out more, and yeah, well, I won't get another one like that in a long time, and that's just like, 
was 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 it worked out in our favor. Yeah, because it felt again so unique for of um, of yours to do something like that because the information is generally something that we have to learn over the course of the movie. Right. Yeah. I mean, usually. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, if you sort of want to find out what the story is with somebody's mother or father, that's a whole thing, you know. But if you sit down with a Q and A, you know, you can fire questions. That's, uh, I'm going to keep that in mind for this. For um, because one of the thing with the so I should do it without blinking, kind of thing. Like, or yeah. blink, and I'll ask the next question. Okay. See, it'll work like that. But a movie we talked about since I've known you, and I've been talking to you since since Boogie Nights, is Baraka has always come up in terms of influence, and just kind of like the the languorous quality, the beginning where there are longer cuts in this in the Master, and in so many of the other movies. I. And I mentioned this to you after I'd seen Boogie Nights, and you went, yeah, Baraka is a movie that means a lot to me. Talk about the first time you saw Baraka and, and how that really kind of moved you. God, I don't, it's, I don't even remember the first time I saw it. Um, it, must have been, it must have been on DVD. Um, I think on DVD. Uh, and I just loved it. I mean, I loved Koyan Ostoski. I'd love, I'd, I like in general movies that are just pictures and music or something like that and that uh, Baraka just kind of really did it for me and then I saw it in the theater you know and that's a whole other experience and um, it's always stuck with me and I will you know anytime I get a chance to kind of drag somebody to it I will do it or I just go on about it um, you know boring people but um, the, um, and the master I showed the first, we, Joaquin and I were always talking about apes and animals and things like that for his character in that film and I showed him the first shot of Barack I don't know if anybody's seen it, it's going to be boring but there's a great shot of a, good, alright I remember the first shot, it's a monkey sorry, it's a monkey um, in the snow and he's falling asleep it's just, and it's really must, must take like two minutes, you know, just to stare at this monkey slowly falling asleep and it is absolutely hypnotizing one of the best things I've ever seen and I showed it to him one day, and I said, you know, and he just loved it, too. I said, let's try and do that, so. Yeah, because <laughs> when I talked to him, he said that you were, by the end of the movie, you were calling him, you know, your pet monkey. And What trick are you going to ask him to do today? Bubbles, Michael Jackson's monkey. <laughs> yeah, it felt like that, like... It felt like having a trained monkey <laughs> that would. No, really. I mean, well, I think it. I think it fit. I, it was. It, it was. You know, that was. That was probably the, one of the ideas in the film. You know, whether we'd really uh, talked about it or not. But what happened? You know, it's like Siegfried and Roy. Like, what happens if you have a tiger? In Chris Rock's word, that goes tiger. You know, it <laughs> went tiger. Um, I think there was discussions about that kind of thing. About you know, having an animal, having a monkey, and putting diapers on it. And what's eventually going to happen is that it's not going to like its little hat and its diapers. It's going to like. It's going to bite you. It's going to get mad. It doesn't like it. And uh, no matter how much it, you know, flips over and does. It's not exactly like the frog in that cartoon that sings. Remember the... Uh, the Michigan J. Frog? <laughs> <laughs> He's not doing the, the, the right. Michigan rag? The Michigan rag, right. <clears throat> but it's more of the, like, the, like, when, like, Bubbles, who went f***ing crazy, you know? Like, <laughs> you... No, please, go. Yeah, no, you can't. Come on, you can't put monkey on a, a diapers on a monkey. I, I hadn't thought about being the lesson of the master until just now, but <laughs> it clears a lot of the movie up for him. But when he told me that, it's weird because the way he moves physically, like an, even when he's wearing a suit, he fe like that sequence when he's working as a photographer in the store mm -hmm. is completely wrong for right. him being in that environment and having to like, and he's even moving around, prowling the room, right. looking for prey, basically, or something to do. I mean, it just speaks, you know, I mean, it's just when you, when you, if you can imagine, you know, the sequel to this film, like what happens? What happens when they, when okay, that that this is over, and now you're set loose, and you have to go get a job. Um, you know, questions arise, like you know, what the f are you supposed to do with your life? How are you supposed to get on with it? How are you supposed to manage a day-to-day -day existence? And um, one thing that we talked about. I talked about with Joaquin, which relates to this kind of stuff, is that not only was there trauma that these guys had come back with, but having a sense of um, a, a master or a commander that you respected and that you liked, who you could look up to, and a sense of schedule uh, in your life. Discipline. Something Dis to do. Discipline, exactly, was... Um, was what suddenly like the, the rug was pulled out from underneath you and, and you were expected to kind of make your way without 
without that, and 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 that alone was difficult. N not to discount all the kind of images that might be floating around in your head from what you've seen and what you've gone through, um, but that kind of structure and that kind of discipline that can be so helpful to people's lives, you know, um, was 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 missing. So, because yeah. we're talking about this and and and. I know Tati and, and Blake Edwards, and one of the things that those guys have in common, and as I was watching The Master too, I felt a little bit of the Days of Wine and Roses, a bit of it, you know? Just that sense of wanting to be told what to do with your life and not knowing where I to go. I don't know that film that well. I know Blake Edwards' stuff so well, and I don't know that film very well. It's the, 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 the most dramatic of all the films, and right. you've got somebody, you got Jack Lemmon, who's essentially a light comedian, right. basically playing out all these traumas, you know, the, the, that sense of being lost. And I really felt that, I guess, watching The Master as much as anything else. And I know that for you, people trying to figure out what to do with loneliness is something, a recurrent theme in your work. And, and I wonder how you imagine that working that into the, in the, in the master so much because it's really a big part of Freddie is that he's completely lonely. Yeah, um, he, yeah, he, yeah. Some, somebody. I guess he's somebody probably that is um, that considers that, that has probably moved through most of his life alone or sort of learned to survive alone. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't completely hunger or desire to be around people or to be part of something but um but y y you know like back to the bubble stick again but the second you know the second he feels too much uh you know goodwill in the room is probably the moment he's going to split you know um the the, the 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 it probably sort of you know that much um love and attention is probably worth bailing on for for somebody like him which is you know it doesn't make any sense but it does you know, for anybody that knows that feeling. Sure. I mean, but loneliness, I mean, I sort of feel like the last section of There Will Be Blood is clearly just kind of going crazy with loneliness to some extent. And the way that loneliness kind of warps people. Uh, you think about the beginning of Sydney, Sydney, I mean, Hard Eight, just, you know, he's the guy who's this made this agreement with loneliness, but these kids don't know what to do. And, and, yeah. and that idea of the way you make your peace with loneliness or you can't deal with it runs through a lot of your work. Yeah, you know, it's like, um, you know, I, I, you know, it's like if you've ever taken a vacation alone, you know, you sort of, you, away, you know, I don't know, you get a few days away from your family or something, and sort of like the first 15 minutes you're thrilled, but, you know, 17 minutes later <laughs> you're like, you're lonely again, you know, you're sad. And I think people like to be with other people, don't they, mostly? Don't we all like being together, mostly? Um... <laughs> I don't know, do we? Mostly, kind of? I don't know. But then again, we like to split. I don't know. I'm vamping. I don't know. Loneliness? I don't know. Elvis? I don't know. I don't mean to watch your movies to ask you these questions. I won't do this again. I know now. <laughs> but that's, I mean, it's that kind of hunger, I think, often to be around people. I mean, you think about, uh, you know, Mark and, and, and Boogie Nights, and, you know, he's really desperate to sort of not be a lonely character. And I f kind of feel like I can see this, this kind of weird arc but from going from him to, to, to Adam in Punch Drunk Love and now to Joaquin in this, these guys who had to figure out a way to deal with this. And, and these are guys who, and these, these other two guys, Adam and, and Mark, can be social. But watching this movie, I kind of felt a little bit about the way that Paul Schrader described Travis Bickle, this guy who's alone, coming back from the war, who's had this regimented life where he was probably at his happiest when he was told what to do every hour of the day and told how to socialize, all these things you're talking about. I got a really nice email the other day from this um, great filmmaker, Tatcha Rosenthal. I haven't talked to her in a while. She, she does stop motion animation. She sent me this really nice note and she said, I was so happy that your movie had a happy ending. Uh, talking about the master, that it had a happy ending, that Freddie ended up where he belonged, naked, and being an animal, f***ing someone else. I thought, I was so great. It really touched me. It made me, f no, really, it made me feel like, you know, so this talk about lonely, yes, of course, you know, he's, he's got a lot of things wrong with him, but that kind of feeling that, I don't know what will happen with him or how it'll go for him, but it was nice to see him in his element, completely naked and f***ing. No, and often for you, when you're working, there's like a, a, a piece of literature, there's a book, 
that you use as, as this kind of like a foundation? Was there something like that for the master? Mm, just lots of Dianetic stuff that I was getting into. Um, there's a great book called Pacific War Diary. Uh, you know this one? I mean, you're not, you weren't supposed to write uh, on ships, and um, I'm going to get his name wrong. James, James Fahey, I think. or uh, Yeah, Fahey. I, it, it might, uh, anyway, um, he had the most detailed... Um, diary that he kept and that he stored away and, and that was published, um, I don't know, 20, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And, um, you know, it was the talk about the best way to kind of really, you know, tr try as hard as you could to kind of understand what it might have been like on those ships. There it is day in and day out. Um, that was really helpful. That was, couldn't get enough of that stuff. Um, and other than that, that's kind of the main stuff. And that was the main book in terms of Freddie's character, really. Um, a lot of stuff from John Steinbeck's biography that was written. Um, stole a lot of stuff from that. Just kind of something like, like loneliness. Not that Steinbeck was a lonely guy, but I think he had a period in his life after he left college where he was kind of very, kind of aimless and. Um, he kind of wanted to be Jack London, but that didn't really work out exactly right. And he worked on various farms, and he worked in a department store. Um, um, and a cannery. And a cannery, yeah. Um, so that stuff, that stuff was really helpful. Um, trying to think of anything else. Everything else is a couple, of, like yeah, Dianetics related stuff. And this is the movie has this w interesting schism between sort of like the past and the present, where. In the past, you're supposed to know what to do with your life, and, and everybody Freddie's surrounded with is kind of an adult. And to some ways, you must wonder if it's he's kind of imagining these people to be more adult than they actually are, because it's all from his point of view. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, isn't it all? That's always the way. Isn't it always the way? You always imagine that somebody's more adult than you are. Somebody's got it all figured out, and you don't. Somebody, you know, and they don't. You know. Yeah. Because um, those scenes we yeah, see with the, 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 no, I never thought of it that way, but absolutely, yeah. 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 The, the scenes we see that are not from his point of view, you can see that, you know, Philip just basically doesn't know what to do with himself. And his wife, that's a great scene with Amy, when she's basically sort of saying, This is who you are, and this is what you're going to do, goddammit. Right. I mean, it's really amazing to see people, those people, not from, from Freddie's point of view, to see that they aren't what they think he is. Right, right. Um, yeah, this, yeah, th yeah, no, you said it better than I can, and that's not something that I thought of, but that, there it is, and I think that's true. You always, you know, you sort of always peer around the corner and wonder if somebody's believing in something that might, that, you know, maybe they might have it all figured out, you know, um, and, and maybe they do. I don't, you know, I, I'll, al yeah, I'll always be thinking somebody's got it more figured out than I do, for sure, you know. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, and then you get over, and then you go over to their house, and it's like smells kind of like cat piss or something. And, you know, like I knew they were weird, you know. Well, <laughs> the, I'm know. not sure if it smells like cat piss in that house, but <laughs> when he's in that that great sequence when he's basically imagining all these women naked and there's a piano uh -huh. people, I mean, that's again, that's sort of like that's one of the greatest things you've ever done, just going, getting inside his head in that way. And if you looked at that guy sitting there, that's the last thing you would have thought was on his mind. <laughs> what I like the most about that, thank you for saying that about it, I like what I thought, it's not really there, what I liked was that here's a person who seemingly could drink anybody under the table and, you know, drink anything and still be standing. And here he is crumbled into the corner who, so with somebody who's absolutely met his match who, you know, at the point when he's sinking and passed out, this guy's just getting started. It was kind of, that's what was my favorite part about that. Besides all the women and all that, it was just like, he's still going. The master can out-party out Freddie. You know, that was... But this and there's something very Steinbeckian about that too, you know. There's that, all the thing in Steinbeck about these guys basically seeing who can like outdo somebody. Yeah. And one guy semi passed out with one eye open watching these things going on around him. In fact, yeah. it's even that, that biography of Steinbeck that's there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it's also kind of a John Ford thing to have some of the stop and start singing and dancing in a movie. It was just like every John Ford movie. There was an, I can't remember what director it was. It might have been Frank Caffro. Somebody was saying something about John Ford and he said, oh, I thought Ford. When he doesn't know what to do, he just casts really long shots shadows or have 
people start singing and dancing. And, <laughs> and when you, now, when, now that I've said this to you, it's going to get in your head every time you see a John Ford movie. You're like, there's those shadows. Why, why are they singing? They're, everybody's dancing. You, okay. And then he gets back to the plot again. You know, you the, no, no, they, they, they sing and dance, and there's a fight. There's so a fight. fight. Yeah, they, they, preferably all at the same time, preferably. with long shadows. Yeah. Yes, it's, <laughs> the, it's the searchers. I mean, you, yeah. you, you can now name it. Chihuahua, you know, all these movies, <laughs> somebody gets these basic, you feel like you're at an Irish wake at those sequences. Somebody's... Right. They sing, they dance, they fight, then they pass out, then they wake up and apologize. Right. Yeah, master, uh, the master singing and dancing stuff is, um, you know, kind of comes from just, just kind of having a character that's like the life of the party, you know, somebody who's, who is not going to be happy unless everything is just jam-packed and full. He's just, um, I think we all know people like that. There was a lot of kind of talk and discussions about what doesn't need to be in the movie. You know, that was always the discussion. And having screenings where, um, just amongst us, where we were just eliminating stuff and seeing if we could do without it. Um, you know, and yeah, trying, trying it without the naked girls dancing, trying it without Amy jerking him off. I mean, you know, you, you go down, you, you try, you know, just you know, the comfort of an editing room should be about seeing what film you're making and seeing what, can, what you can do without, you know. It was not really ever, it's not any fun to go in there knowing exactly what you're meant to put in and go and do it. That's just, that would be dull. This was like really kind of fun to just sort of mess around with the film and see what, what you know, what we wanted to do, really. That's, that was what that was. Whatever he saw was probably just some incarnation along the path of making the film. Talk to me about the decision to shoot in 70 because it's to go from looking at those that perfect sort of academy box uh, that 133 of those uh, those documentaries right. to that size frame. Well, we tried to keep the frame smaller than normal on 70 mil, which is meant to be two to one, you know. Um, so we boxed it in, so we made it 185, which um, but there's more headroom than there normally is on 185, a little bit more it? headroom, you know, and less width. Um, and that that uh, that idea was yeah because the stuff that I was 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 this kind of stuff was let there be light and films of that period which um, somehow everything just felt a little bit more intimate and I knew we were making a movie that was like a lot of you know closed in, you know in not wide open spaces it was closed rooms and stuff and you could maybe do shots where you had somebody head to toe and in a in a room and it seemed to fit you know more than anything more than any real justification was just a kind of like it works. That that seems right. Let's do it that way. Um, and that goes for shooting it in 70 millimeter too. You know, I mean, I, I can't. It was like half baked ideas about how to make the film or what format to shoot it in, and they were all just that, just half baked ideas. And we started shooting tests at Panavision, and we're hoping we would see something that that felt right, where he just looked at it and you said, "That's that's that's good. That's what it should be." And with those cameras, that's what it turned out to be. Did you like the 70? I mean, just immediately? Yeah. I mean, because there's just a kind of a, a power in that frame that you just don't get. It's true. I love it. It was great. Um, great. Um, and long, long may it wave. I mean, I think, you know, I think it, I think people, hopefully people will use it more often and hopefully theaters will, more theaters will continue to bring back or at least save their projectors, and yeah, it would be great to have it around, you know. I mean, it doesn't seem to me, I mean, I know what these video projectors, the size of them, it does, you don't have to throw a 70 millimeter projector away in the garbage um, to make room for a digital projector. You can keep them both. There's no, there's no you know, it's like, you know, it's like, making room for a lawn chair for a projectionist or something. It's like there's enough room up there for everything. Well, I think after tonight, we're definitely not going to throw our projectors away. But well, I know um, you won't. But I, I think, though, it's, it's what I, I liked about this, because I was expecting like a classic 70 millimeter frame, and it wasn't that. It's almost like you sort of reconceived it as you, this way you're saying, because it's, it's kind of one through three, but it's not. It's a lot taller. Right. We thought we were real clever, and we thought, oh, my God, I think we're the first people to ever do this. And then we realized like Jacques Tati had done it on a film that I saw, that I loved, Playtime. So anytime you think you're cool, well, he you're did doing it for something. like the you got those long boulevards, though, and you're doing it for a very different thing. Well, yeah, but that's the same reason you did it because you needed to do it, and it seemed right. It's the same reason, you know. Yeah, because um, but I can't like 
for some reason, 70 millimeters seems to be the perfect frame size for Philip Seymour Hoffman. I don't know why that is, but <laughs> he seems to be made for it as an actor. You know what I mean? <laughs> Is that a compliment? That's true. It's true. It's true. You know what? That should be like that should be a um, like a poster, or they would have done that in the old days. Absolutely. You know, because like certain this, actors yeah. who, well, of a certain sort of size as actors in terms of what they throw off, we need a kind of frame like that. It's funny because I was just you know I got I tried to walk around the Kubrick exhibit for a second beforehand, and they've got a great still of Charles Lawton from Spartacus, and. I know Phil doesn't really know Charles Lawton stuff very well. He just he just doesn't. But they they remind me of each other and their kind of um, and not only their hamminess, which is, can be so great, but uh, you know, but don't don't think that it, they, that's just what they do. They can do everything and that kind of skill as a comedian, as an act, as as everything, um, and just absolutely watchable. And talking about needing 70 millimeters to film them. It's, I think Charles Lawton was the same way. I just feel that, feel that way. Some actors are like that, you know? Some actors just, you wouldn't think Phil Hoffman the way, you know, would be um, a great person to fill the, the, uh, a movie screen, but to me, he is, yeah. It's, I, 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 I'm glad you feel the same Yeah, because I hadn't thought that until I saw I thought, God, of course. This is exactly it, because I think I saw the movie maybe a month after I saw him doing Death of a Salesman, and he's like, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what this is because there's that size. Was also like the way he uses the voice. I mean, he's and again the character he's playing is somebody who's completely confident in his voice. And you often cast people with the who love to speak. And they think back to Tom Cruise and and, and Magnolia, or even to some extent uh, Burt Reynolds and, and Boogie Nights. These guys will know exactly what to do with their voice every time they speak. You really love guys like that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. They're easy to write. They can you know once you start you know getting them to talk like that it's it, you have to stop yourself from writing that kind of stuff and put a discipline on it because those are like you know the way that Phil talks in this movie it's also um you know aristocratic and I, I don't know what it is, but, but you it's, know, it's fake. Doctor, you know, but it's, it's fake aristocratic, though, and he gets this enormous sure, amount of pleasure sure. from throwing it on someone like Freddie, who doesn't know the difference. I mean, he might as well be talking to the King of England. <laughs> and it's really wonderful watching that exchange. It's it's a, it's a way that these guys, so many of these guys in these movies, even Sydney and Howard Eight, they measure their power by the way people react to the way they speak. Sure, and they hypnotize people with their voices. Well, you know, probably that's, that's my dad used to talk like that. My dad had a great voice, and, uh, he, you know, he, he, um, he would just talk like a normal guy to you and everything else, and uh, everything was going great. And the minute you f***ed up, every, this register would completely change, and everything, you know, the, the you did way... did the only innocent only when you got mad? He, everything would get a little bit deeper, and you would say, you know, f and, you know and, you, and you would shape up. Like, okay, he got, the voice just went down a few octaves. So he didn't talk like that normally. That was like his stage voice, basically. Yeah, for sure. Um, he had a deep, kind of deep voice to begin with, but um, no, but he didn't, you know, he didn't say, you know. Tonight on the love boat well, you know, for the exactly. house. <laughs> he would go to Denny's and say, two eggs, hash browns, and toast. <laughs> Old joke. A terrible joke. <laughs> I'm going to let you go, but let's thank Paul Thomas Anderson for coming to share his night with us. Thank you so much.